All right, well, first I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to, to give this talk and you for staying till the last day and waking up in the morning to come here. Um, so I will talk about self-gravitating system, so this kind of ties in with what Michael Joyce was talking to us about, but I will talk about isolated systems. So the idea is um, that The idea is that we want to, starting with some kind of initial condition, we would like to predict where the system will relax. So it's a system of stars, and we want to evolve it in time and see where it arrives. So uh, this work was done with people in our department, so Renato Pachter, Felipe Rizzato. So these two usually work on nonlinear dynamics and plasmas. Tarsicio was a, uh, was a graduate student and then postdoc. Fernando Benetti, who you heard the talk and the poster was the first day, and then Bruno Marcos, who visited us in Porto Alegre for a year. Um, so, as I said, the idea is to try to understand the structure of, let's say, an elliptical galaxy. So, uh, often you find uh, in this kind of system that you have a quite well-defined core structure and then there is a halo of surrounding stars. And this is actually very similar to what is observed in plasma physics. So if you take uh, ions and you inject them into the accelerator, so in general you can think about kind of lines of charge of propagating in, in, in one direction. Uh, and of course the magnetic field, the solenoidal magnetic field provides a confinement. And then if you eject the particles into the accelerator, what you see often is that there is some kind of oscillations and relaxation process that goes in, and then the system relaxes to a state, which again has this characteristic kind of core halo structure. There is a dense core, and then there is a halo of, of highly energetic particles which surround the core. Um, so this is, there is certain similarity with the gravitational systems. Of course, in Coulomb case, you have to have a confinement. While for gravity, you don't need to confine, at least if you're in two-dimensional or one-dimensional gravity. In three-dimensional gravity, things are much more complicated. And I will just mention a little bit at the end what we have done with 3D gravity. Um, so uh, maybe before I get into the discussion, I will show you a little movie that actually Bruno prepared. Um, so this is a system of two-dimensional gravitational particles. So the particles interact by the logarithmic potential. I started them from some uniform distribution. And what you're seeing there are this kind of density oscillation. So what, what actually happens is that the particles start here and they kind of cross through each other and expand. So in the end, it looks like the system collapses, re-expands, and you see this formation as, as as the, as the time progresses of this kind of core structure here, and you see this halo of surrounding particles. So this process goes on and on, and after a while we will see that this core, well, you, you can already see that the oscillations of the core are becoming dumped out, and there is a very well-defined halo which, that is being formed, and what we want to see is, given the initial condition, that, that initial water bag distribution where the particles were uniformly distributed inside the disk, and I gave them some velocities from some kind of distribution of velocities, so this is my initial condition, I want to see, can I predict what will be the final state? Of course, if the system would be equilibrium, this would be quite simple, because we know the final state corresponds to the Maxwell uh, to the Boltzmann equilibrium, and then we could just solve the you know, Boson-Boltzmann type of equation and predict where the system would evolve. Uh, for the self-gravitating systems, this is not the case, because uh, what happens is that if we really want to study this kind of systems in the thermodynamic limit, uh, the collisional effects become irrelevant. So the two-body collisions are not important in the thermodynamic limit, and everything is governed by the collective effect. So you have the collective effect that one particle just feels a mean field produced by all the other particles. And if we look at the evolution of the distribution function, what we see is that the distribution function, F, evolves in the phase space according to what we have heard 
is a Vlasov equation. So the Vlasov equation has this form here, and one way to think about this Vlasov equation as being just a convective derivative over the phase space. So, and of course, the convective derivative on the phase space tells us that if I look at one particle, the density along the evolution of this particle, the density of other particles in the neighborhood of this one particle will be preserved along the flow. So this is a, a peculiarity of the Vlasov equation compared to the Boltzmann equation, which would have a collision or coronal here, uh, which would drive them the system to equilibrium. In the Vlasov case, this is not the, this is not the case. So one of the, one of the curious things, of course, of the Vlasov equation is that it has an infinite number of invariants, which are called as Casimirs. Basically, any local function of the distribution function is a Casimir invariant. Okay. Yeah, and in particular, of course, Boltzmann entropy is a Casimir invariant. So if, as the system evolves, the Boltzmann entropy is preserved. And you can say, well, but you showed me the simulation where I started with some uniform distribution, which obviously had lower entropy, and then it's evolved to something which was much more disordered. So clearly, entropy is growing. So what's going on? Well. To see what's going on in the system, we really have to uh, look at the phase space more carefully. So, uh, so this is the HMF model, famous HMF model that Stefano introduced to the community a long time ago. Uh, so here what I'm doing is I'm just plotting the initial distribution, so it's a little distorted because the way that we created the initial conditions, but it doesn't make any difference. So this is for HMF model, so I give the momentum and the angle of the particle. So this is initial distribution. And then I just turn the equations of motion. So it's just Hamilton's equation of motion, Newton's equations of motion. And then we see the evolution of this, this phase space. And we see that the phase space gets distorted. So it becomes kind of elliptical. And then it kind of starts folding on itself because I have periodic boundary conditions. So I have the stretching and folding of the phase space. But if I look at the area of this, it's exactly the same as area of this, exactly the same as area of this, and exactly the same as area of this. So what's happening in this process of the dynamical evolution that uh, the entropy is preserved. So if I look at the microscopic entropy, I see that it's completely conserved. However, as the process of evolution keeps going and the system keeps evolving, what we see is that this filamentation process keeps going and going and on. Here, I'm still having exactly the same area that I started here. But if I look at this thing, I lost all the memory. Because, and this is not such a large time for the system. So after some time, we come to this state. Of course, if I look microscopically, I will see that this, this area is full of holes. So in principle, it will be exactly the same as it. But on the coarse grain scale of the simulation or whatever measurement that I will be able to perform, this thing here obviously has a larger entropy. And if I calculate the, the entropy really for the, using the Boltzmann definition of entropy, I will see that this state here has larger entropy than this initial state. All right, so we kind of understand that, but uh, there is another peculiarity of this, of this loss of dynamics, and that is this conservation of density, this incompressibility of the flow over the phase space. And so to visualize this, I mean, if I take, so imagine that this is my phase space here and I start with some water back initial distribution. So I just have a uniform distribution of velocities and positions of my particles. So this is kind of what we call water back distribution. Uh, so if I would be in two dimensions or three dimensions, this would be the maximum radius until which I will distribute my particles, and this would be the maximum velocity, so I'll just distribute it uniformly. And this would be then the maximum phase, this is my phase space density, so this eta is the phase space density. So as the system evolves, uh, what we will see is that this different, this, this levels will just get spread over the phase space, and of course we can, divide the phase space into the macrocells and microcells. But the point is that these microcells cannot have two of the squares, two covered squares, sitting on top of each other, because this would violate the, 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 the incompressibility dynamics of the Vlasov flow. So this is, this, is, this is really the fundamental observation. And as far as I, I know, Linden Bell, that, that Fernanda mentioned in her talk, was 
really the first one to, to make this observation that there is this incompressibility dynamics of the velocity flow, which if we want to construct some kind of series, this is the most important ingredient. Of course, there are infinite number of conserved quantities, but this incompressibility is really the fundamental thing that we have to take into account. So, uh, so the idea is that, well, uh, as the system will evolve, what has to happen is that there will be final distribution, but for this initial condition that I, I said, the water bag initial condition, what we see is that the distribution function always has to be less than or equal to this initial phase space density. So it can never exceed this value because of the incompressibility of the flow. So this is really a fundamental observation that we, just, that we make and which will be the basis for everything that I will tell you. So for example, going back to the gravity, so here is a, a case of 1D gravity here. So again, I, I distribute my particles uniformly inside this water back initial distribution. And so this is 1D, so the same idea is that the gravity in 1D satisfies the Poisson equation, so particles interact linearly with separation, so the potential is linear. So I just turn the equations of motion, the Newton's equation of motion, evolve my system, and I will arrive to the same kind of core halo structure, but remember this is in the, in the phase space now, so this is the velocity and this is the position. So I have this core in the in the phase space here, and then I have this halo of particles. So uh, what we really need to do is to understand then where this uh, core halo structure comes from. And the series that I will show you then is going to be this solid curve here, and the points are the molecular dynamic simulation. So as you will see, the series really works very well to predict, starting with the initial condition, we can predict where the system evolves, and this initial, this dotted lines here is my initial distribution. So the system moves quite far away from the initial distribution, so these are two different initial conditions. So this is a density distribution, this is velocity distributions. So you can see for two different initial conditions that the system evolves exactly where our theory will predict that it should go. Very good, so uh, from now on I will concentrate on 2D systems, so just to, 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 to sketch the theory for you, but then we will go back a little bit for 3D systems, and but you will have the idea of how things work. Okay, so, um, so we'll, we'll start with the Vlasov equation here. So the idea is that you have to solve Vlasov equation in conjunction with the Poisson equation. So I have 2D gravity particles now interact by logarithmic potential. So I have to solve the Vlasov equation and of course the potential here, the gravitational potential satisfies the Poisson equation. This is the mass of the particles here. So this is the density distribution. So to get the density distribution, I integrate over the velocities, plug it in here, and I can do this process in principle iteratively to solve the Poisson equation. The problem is Poisson equation is really hard to solve. It's extremely unstable, it's hard to discretize. Of course, there are some experts here, Tarsisio, I don't know if he's here. So there are people who know how to do these things well, but it's a lot of work and for a gravitational system it's very hard to do. You can do it for simple models like HMF and we did it. But but in general, this is not something that we want to do. So the idea is that I don't want to solve the Vlasov equation. I want to start with the initial condition and predict where the system will evolve without going through whole dynamics. So, so to understand what's going on, we have to look at the particle evolution. So let's, let's take a simple case. We can think about the first thing that we want to do is we saw that the fundamental thing that was happening and that movie that I showed you is that there was this huge density oscillation. So I had this system of particles which clearly was oscillated. So what we can do is we can define an envelope of this oscillation. So I started with a water bag, and then I just look at the root mean square displacement of my particles, and I see how this thing will evolve. Okay. And for this system, actually, we can write fairly simple equation, which is, which is an approximate equation. Uh, which tells me how the envelope evolves. So we can derive this equation. It's not perfect, obviously, but it predicts us how this RMS evolves. So with this kind of equation, we can predict that the envelope of these oscillations 
has this periodic structure. And of course, since this is, there is no dumping in this thing, so it just keeps going, this oscillations. If I look at the simulations, we actually see that the periodicity of oscillations is captured very well by this equation. So this is a maximum velocity. This is my maximum radius of the initial distribution. And then I just solve this for initial conditions. So we see that the, the periodicity of oscillations is captured very well. Uh, the other thing that we see is that in the simulations, actually, there is this dumping. So where is this dumping comes from? Well, when we see something oscillating and we have particles inside an oscillating potential, we know that there is going to be some resonance. So some particles enter in resonance with these oscillations, and they can gain a lot of energy. So once these particles gain a lot of energy, they escape from this main course and go to the halo. Okay, so the resonance drives the particles to the halo. But of course, the whole energy of the system has to be conserved. This is just the Hamiltonian dynamics. So the energy that the particles gain has to come from somewhere, and it comes from these oscillations. So this is kind of the process of Landau dumping, which we heard about already, uh, which dampens this collective oscillations, passing energy from the collective mode to the individual particles. So uh, to try to understand it more qu quantitatively, what we can do is, well, let's look at the dynamics of one particle. So now I know that I, I have a pretty accurate equation of motion for this collective oscillations of my envelope. So let's suppose that the density inside the envelope is going to stay constant. So I just I finally rescale my density distribution. So I compress, expand, but the distribution inside we're going to say stays uniform. Okay, so with that I can solve for the potential produced by this uniform mass distribution, so I know exactly what the potential is, and this potential is going to oscillate. Well, the, since I know the boundary of my distributions, and this is 2D gravity, so what we see is that the force for the particle when it's outside this envelope is going to go like this, so it's just derivative of the log, so I have 1 over r, so this is just a force in 2D. And then when the particle is inside this uniform mass distribution, then the force is going to be this. So I take a test particle and I put it inside this oscillation, oscillating potential, and I want to see what's going to be the motion. And of course, since I have oscillations, I know exactly what is the periodicity of these oscillations. So I can do a stroboscopic plot. So I do like a Poincaré section of this thing and plot the dynamics of this one particle. So each time the envelope is at its minimum, I plot the position and the velocity of a particle. So what we see is when the oscillations are very small, so if I start with some initial condition where there are almost no oscillations, then of course the dynamics is just going to be integrable dynamics of the, of the system. So I just have this normal orbits that I see. If the oscillations are large, what happens is exactly this resonance that I told you. So we have the formation of this resonance island, and some particles which were close to the border of the envelope suddenly gain a lot of energy and escape from the envelope, and they go to up to this position. So they can go up to this thing here. So that's a huge energy gain for the particles. And so this is the mechanism of the formation of the halo. The particles gain energy from the oscillations, they escape. As they escape, they dampen the oscillations, and this process will just keep going. Of course, if the system would be collisional, what would happen is that, well, particles keep evaporating, the rest of the system just keeps cooling down, cooling down, until you get to the minimum of the potential energy, so you just collapse to the point. But in Vlasov dynamics, you cannot do that because you have that constraint that the maximum density that the system can evolve is that eta from the original distribution. So it's kind of like a spin degeneracy in quantum systems. You get to the maximum spin, you, you fill up all the lowest energy levels of your system, and there is nothing more that you can do. So the oscillations will stop out when all the particles which could evaporate from the system, and the core just collapses to this final maximum density state. So. Uh, with that, we can really make an answer. So here, just to show you that, that based on, on this one particle, test particle dynamics, we can predict very accurately. So here, just, just this one particle dynamics with different initial conditions. So we can just predict 
very accurately where this resonant energy is or how far the particles can go. So this is just one particle dynamics here, so we see this. And if I look at the whole n-body simulation problem with all the particles interacting gravitationally, we see that the maximum energy where the particle will go is exactly the same as this. So it really is a resonant process which, which expels the particles from, from the core and drives them to form the halo. So the idea is the following. Okay, so now we understood this, we understood this dumping process, so let's just make an answer for the distribution function. So what we make is an answer exactly what I said. The process of evaporative cooling just cools down the core. That means that all the low energy states up to the Fermi energy, which we will define as the maximum energy, will be occupied with the maximum distribution, which is on the phase space which is allowed by the velocity of dynamics, which is this initial eta that we started with. So all the low energy states are occupied, and then the dynamics and drives the, the, the halo particles towards the resonance. So the resonance then, this resonance energy we calculated from, the, uh, from, from this one particle dynamics, so we have the number exactly for this thing here, so we know that, and we say that the, the, the halo part here then is going to be occupied with some density. Yep. So the core is occupied with the maximum permitted density. Halo is occupied with some density chi, which we don't know, which we have to determine. So we have in this thing, we have two parameters. We have this Fermi energy here, which enters here, and chi. So we have two parameters, which we don't know, but we have also two equations for the conservation. So I know that the dynamics is such that it has to preserve the total energy of the system because it's Hamiltonian dynamics and I have to preserve the norm. So with those two conditions I can determine these two parameters which I have in my theory. Then I solve the Poisson equation with the density distribution on the phase space that I define and we find the distribution of the particles over the phase space here so this is our halo part, this is the core part, so these are the simulation points here, and this is a series that I told you about. So there is no, no adjustable parameters in this series. So we, we predict, we calculate where the, the resonance energy is, and then we just solve with that Ansan's distribution. So this is the velocity distributions, and of course you can see that it's completely known Maxwell Boltzmann. There is this kind of halo part here which has this fat tail here, um, different from just exponential decay. So we can also look at the temperature distribution. So this is what's, what Lapa was talking about the other day. Uh, so you see that, of course, since the system is out of equilibrium, uh, the temperature is not uniform inside. So this, this particle distribution did, didn't evolve to equilibrium. It's, it's in this funny quasi-stationary state which, in principle, will go somewhere, then we will see where it's going to go. But if I look at just big beams along, uh, along the radial direction, what I see is that the temperature varies like this, and this is exactly this temperature inversion that, that Lapa was discussing the other day. Uh, so you go, so this is the core part, and you have this huge jump here, which is for the halo part, but then, of course, it dies down because the velocities of particles are confined by the resonance. Uh, if I can. This one. Yeah. No, but because I have to integrate over the velocities. Yes, yeah, this is this is the phase space. Uh, so this is the the distribution function, and you see that it's going to be a stationary solution of the velocity equation because it depends only on the one particle then, uh, energy. So this epsilon is the energy of one particle, which I should have said, uh, and so the, the, uh, this is one. So we have to, when we get the density distribution, in the we have to integrate over the velocities, and this is what I was plotting. And if I want the, the, the velocity distribution, then I have to integrate over the positions. Okay, so this is a temperature distribution, so we see this inversion here. So as I promised to you, I wanted to say a little bit about 
uh, about 3D gravity. So um, 3D gravity is really is a nightmare uh, for anybody who tried to do 3D gravity knows how hard it is. First of all, there is even, I mean, you have to soften potential. Uh, how you soften it makes difference. Um, then the particles, there is no resonance like in 2D or 1D because the particles can actually gain sufficient energy to evaporate. Well, this is an old problem. I mean, in three-body problem, you often find that you start with some state and the particle, one of the particles just gains enough energy from the other particle and just goes away. So this is the old problem of stability of solar system if it's going to fly away at some point. Uh, so it, it, it's really very difficult to do anything with 3D gravity. I mean, we tried for, for a long time to, to get somewhere with that. Uh, what we managed so far is to, is to, study, to study 3D gravity um, for the spe special initial condition. So this is the virial condition. So in 3D, you remember that there is a virial theorem which tells us that two times the energy has to be equal minus the potential energy uh, if the system is in the stationary state. So what we do is we prepare the distribution, the water bag, so our distribution is still a water bag. We know from the virial theorem that if the system will evolve to final stationary state, if there is exists a final stationary state, somehow it would have to satisfy this virial condition. So what I say is I will produce a water bag distribution, but I will adjust the velocities in such a way that the virial theorem is satisfied. Okay. This does not prevent, this doesn't tell me that the distribution that I constructed is going to be a stationary distribution. To be stationary distribution, it has to be a solution of the Vlasov equation. This arbitrary distribution that I, I, I started with would just satisfy this virial condition will not be stationary and will have some kind of dynamics which will relax and go to the stationary condition. However, if I start with the virial condition, what we know is that the oscillations will be small. So different from this resonant oscillation that we saw in the other case, if I start with virial condition, what we see is that the particles will not oscillate. So we will not see very strong oscillations. So if we don't have the resonances, then the process of relaxation to equilibrium should be kind of adiabatic. Well, if the process is kind of adiabatic, then we can think, well, maybe the dynamics of the system is really not so far away from some kind of uh, integrable dynamics. So if I think about the particles in my initial distribution, so exactly what Fernanda was telling us about uh, in, in the case of the Hamiltonian mean field model, if we start with, with a particle, it will fill the mean field, and this mean field will change very little over the evolution because the system is, doesn't have any strong resonances. So the particles will just evolve under the action of the mean field, so they will have this orbit. If I look at some density shell, what will happen is that the particles over the density shell will just get smeared out because it's nonlinear system, so I have different frequencies. So after some time, I expect that the dynamics will just smear out and the particles with a given energy will just be occupying the whole orbit which is permitted. So even if I start with some initial condition, which is I don't have in my initial distribution the whole orbit field, the particles, after some time, will fill out this whole orbit. So then we can think, well, OK. So the dynamics is such that it's almost integrable, so it's kind of adiabatic dynamics. So let's say, so let's construct the initial, let's construct the distribution to which the system will evolve. So as I said, I started with some number of particles. These particles will move under the action of some potential. So I know exactly what, how many particles I will have with a, differ, with, with a given energy. So I can calculate, and this will be preserved because the number of particles, the particles, there's no resonance interactions as the particles just move in a fixed potential. So the energy of each particle is conserved, right? So this is a difference with a, non, with a resonant case where particles could gain energy. Here the particles just move in some mean field potential. So if I know what is the initial, energy, it will be the same as the final energy of the distribution. So this will be then the number of particles that I will have with a given energy here in my initial distribution. 
It, the difference here is that we really have to be much more careful because these are subtle effects. So we also have to take into account that since my potential is spherically symmetric, my angular momentum will also be conserved. So what I do is I look at the number of particles in my initial distribution which have given energy and given initial angular momentum. And I calculate how many particles I have with given energy and given initial angular momentum. And this gives me this number here. To get the distribution function, what I have to do is to take this number of particles and divide it over this phase space that is permitted. So what I do is I calculate the density of states that I have. So I just calculate again for a given distribution function. I just integrate over the phase space with a constraint that my energy has to be given to a certain value and angular momentum is given to a certain value. So I can calculate this thing here. So given the initial distribution, we can calculate what will be the final distribution which has this kind of complicated. So this is my initial distribution as a function of R and V. And all I have to do is substitute this thing here. This, this is my energy. This is a potential, which in principle I do not know yet because this is a mean field potential under, the, under which the dynamics will evolve. And so this is my distribution function. So for a given energy and L uh, and angular momentum, I know how many particles I will have uh, per Per, per volume of the phase space. Okay, so what, what do we do? We have the distribution function, so now we just integrate over the, so remember that this is the particle energy here, so we can just integrate over the velocities, and this would give me the density distribution, and then I plug it into the Poisson equation and solve that. Uh, uh, so this is the predictions of this theory. So, uh, so this is my initial distribution. We try different initial conditions, different initial distributions. It doesn't have to be a water bag anymore because we don't use this conservation of, I mean, it's, everything is naturally preserved like in the velocity flow because basically the evolution of particles is non-interactive. Non so we just fix the potential, which was undetermined, self-consistent. So these are the... Uh, the points, the molecular dynamic simulations for 3D gravity. Uh, and this is the theory. This, so this was the initial condition that we started when the systems and relaxes to this. So this is a density distribution. This is a velocity distribution. This is the initial condition. So the system moves quite far away. Even so that we fixed the virial condition, it does not fix the final distribution. The system will evolve somewhere. Uh, but without exciting the resonances. Uh, so this is a different initial condition, so we see that again the system follows exactly where the series. And this is a case which is, which is nice because we don't have, why can we solve it? Because we do not have strong oscillations, we do not excite the resonances, and the particles just evolve into very controlled dynamics. So with this kind of approach we can calculate the final distributions. Uh, as soon as you excite any oscillation, then you start producing this evaporations and life, everything goes to hell. Um, so I still have a few minutes. Um, so what I want to tell you, just this crossover, so of course, if we're going to wait sufficient time, the system, if it's finite, it should evolve to equilibrium, at least for 2D gravity or 1D one, one gravity the system should evolve to equilibrium. So we can just look, since we know the distribution of the particles in, in the core state here, we can just define a measure here how far away the system is from the final quasi-stationary distribution here. So what we see is, so I take this thing, so this is what we calculate theoretically, and this is then we measure in the this, in this simulations, and then we just do this integral numerically. So we start somewhere here at, at time equals zero, and the system very rapidly evolves to this quasi-stationary state, and then if we wait long enough, then the system starts to go somewhere else. So this depends on the number of particles, so for 500, 750, then you get to 20,000. 20,000, we cannot wait sufficient amount of time because it just takes so long to to evolve to this other state. So the system just keeps staying in this quasi-stationary state. So as n goes to infinity, exactly what we expect. This quasi-stationary state will just last forever. So if we take 
take this, this ten, the, the time variable and we just rescale it with, with this kind of dynamical time, uh, which depends on the, on the number of particles, we see that we can collapse all of these curves. So there is a crossover time which scales as n to this 1.35 uh, for this, this, mon this molecular dynamic simulation that we constructed. And all these curves and collapse on one, which tells us that there is a characteristic crossover scale while the where the system moves out of this quasi-stationary state and goes somewhere else. Where does it go? Well, it goes to the Boltzmann equilibrium. So as I said, if the system goes to Boltzmann equilibrium, then things are very simple because in this kind of thermodynamic limit that we're taking, the correlations between the particles are irrelevant, and we can just solve the Poisson-Boltzmann equation. So I, my distribution function is just going to be the usual distribution function for the, for the Boltzmann equation. So this is the velocity. This is uh, the self-consistent gravitational potential. I just plug it and integrate over the velocity, decouple. So it just gives me a constant. So I solve this equation here. And when the system has crossed into into this state here, we wait a long time, the system crossed into the state, we look at the velocity distributions, we look at the density distributions, and we see that they perfectly satisfy for the 2D gravity case, perfectly satisfy with the prediction of the Boltzmann-Gibbs statistics. So when the system moves out of the quasi-stationary state, it goes to equilibrium, it doesn't go to funny generalized entropy, statistics, it goes to thermodynamic equilibrium as it should. Okay, uh, I don't think I'll have much time to tell you, but let, let me just show you the movie. Uh, so the other interesting thing here in the systems is, uh, is that if you start with the initial conditions, so let's say you take 2D system and you start with the initial condition, uh, which is very hot or very cold. So here we started with the initial condition which was quite hot, so the particles had a lot of velocity, so the system just kind of starts exploding. And so this is 2D gravity again, so we're looking at the X, Y coordinates. So I started with a disk in which I put particles with some positions, arbitrary distributed and given them some velocity from some initial velocity distribution, but the velocity, I put a lot of velocity in them. So this is why we're seeing, but of course particles cannot escape because in 2D potential is logarithmic, so it would take an infinite amount of energy to take the particle to infinity. So they go far, but they come back. And what we are starting to see is that along this evolution, we're starting to break the spherical symmetry. So there is this breaking of the spherical symmetry that, that happens here. And if we wait, we'll see that we started with this kind of state. This is x, y coordinates. This is initial. Uh, 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 so we, st we start with, with this kind of distribution. And then if the uh, virial number is not too far away from the virial condition, so when it's close to 1, we go to the normal core halo state here. If the virial number is too large or too small compared to the one, then we break the symmetry and end up with this kind of thing. So this happens in 2D, it happens in 3D, but in 3D what will happen is that in this collapse and re-expansion, you would just have so many particles ejected that you will just, uh, you, you don't have a very clear picture again of what's going on. But it still will break the symmetry in the same way that happens in 2D systems. So I could just sketch very quickly for you how, how we do the calculations. I think this thing got stuck now. Yeah, yeah. all right, let me just... Uh, so what we do is we basically look at the distribution functions in arbitrary dimensions, so we can do this calculation in arbitrary dimensions. We define the envelope here for the, since we're in x, y, and z, so this one, x1, x2, x3 will correspond to x, y, and z coordinates, four dimensions we can go, and this is the velocity. And then what we do is we construct 
an effective equation for this velocity, uh, for this envelope evolution. So this x, y, and z, the average velocity uh, position distributions, this RMS distributions, if we allow for the symmetry breaking, we have to construct this thing. And uh, there is, well, when we solve these equations here, this dynamical equation, what we see is that there is actually symmetric and anti-symmetric mode. And what happens is that the oscillations of the symmetric mode drive the oscillations of the anti-symmetric mode, and then there is a certain parametric resonance if we are above certain value of the virial number, which will then result in the symmetry breaking. So unfortunately, I don't have time to go through this, but just to conclude, uh, so here, this is the value that we find for 2D. Uh, so if the virial number is less than this or larger than this, we will have this instability and symmetry breaking. In 3D, we find these numbers here. Um, so let me just conclude. Uh, so systems uh, with long range interactions, of course, don't have, in the thermodynamic limit, do not, they do not have ergodicity or mixing. Uh, but there is a certain universality that we saw in this core halo distribution that describes very well what happens with plasmas, with HMF, because we see it all the time. So it it's appears everywhere in plasmas, HMF, gravitational systems. Uh, so there is a certain degree of universality. Of course, it's not the same as equilibrium. The, 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 the final distribution will depend on the initial distribution that I started with. But the final distribution always has this kind of core halo structure in the phase space. Um, so I think I'll stop here. And then if you're interested, so there is this review here that we wrote, um, which has a lot of details about all the systems that I discussed. So.